Good afternoon. My name is Pirjo Haikola. I am a designer, a researcher, a certified scuba diving instructor, a sailor, and an ocean advocate. I'm going to talk today about more than human design for the ocean and what it means if non-humans, for example, these little creatures, are our clients in the design process. These things, smaller than rice grains, are coral larvae swimming inside in our prototype tiles in the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program for the Great Barrier Reef. Before speaking about designing for corals, I want to provide a bit of context to how I got here. Why am I, or why should anyone be designing for the ocean? Some years ago, I took what I thought would be an indefinite break from design to work as a scuba diving instructor. I went to work first at the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, and after that at the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef in Mexico. What you see here is what I expected. Vibrant, healthy, beautiful reefs full of life. And I did definitely see some of that amazing part of these reefs. But I happened to work at the Great Barrier Reef during one of the recent mass bleaching events that are now becoming more and more common. There was one in 2016, 2017, 2020, and again last year. I have now seen a bleaching event at the reef three times. After Australia, I went to work in Mexico, and I saw also in, bad, bad, in part badly degraded reef due to multiple human-caused pressures. Currently, globally, around 30,000 square meters of coral reef is in declining health that could still benefit from restoration. So, although bleaching doesn't always lead to coral mortality, the bleaching and degradation can look like something like this. A barren, lifeless seascape, void of life. And it is one thing to know this is happening, but it's quite another to witness and to see this. So I decided to go back to design, but to figure out how we can design not only for humans, but for the environment and for the ocean. I will discuss connected stories from two Australian locations, the Great Barrier Reef in Northern Australia and Port Phillip Bay in Southern Australia. And I will give two examples of how design can contribute to ocean conservation and regeneration. I moved to Melbourne, to the colder southern part of Australia, and diving there, I found out that climate change is impacting the ocean there as well. One of the issues there is the overpopulation of sea urchins, caused by warming water, excess nutrients, and lack of predators. And this is happening in many parts of the world, not only in Australia. And you might wonder why is it significant that there are too many urchins, but it is important because they eat seaweeds that are like the corals of the temperate water. They provide habitat and food for all the other marine animals. And when they are gone, the result is very similar than when corals perish and there's very little life left. Sea urchins like corals are calcifiers and take calcium from the seawater and make it into their hard calcium carbonate shells and skeletons. And as a designer, I was interested in if I could use this potential byproduct from food industry how it could be potentially useful as a material, and could I use it to talk about um, these problems in the ocean? One intriguing thing that I found out about the shells are the naphtoquinone pigments. They are antialgal, antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, and they have been investigated for medical purposes, for example. They are like the immune system of the sea urchins. The main ingredient in the shells, the calcium carbonate, is also used as a filler for polymers or plastics. And we decided to blend urchin shells with marine degradable biopolymers to create biomimetic blends that we could use with different production techniques. And at this point, this was purely speculation, but I was curious whether a material like this could be used in, used in coral restoration, even protect the corals, as it was similar to coral skeletons and mass manufacturable. I will speak a little bit about the first example of how design can contribute to ocean conservation and regeneration. An opportunity came to create an installation for the National Gallery of Victoria 2020 International Triennial in Melbourne that would address these issues and opportunities in Australian waters. So one way design can contribute to protecting the ocean 
is through increasing ocean literacy. That is, public understanding of the ocean and by bringing these hidden issues to the surface. The exhibition also provides a reason to experiment further with these materials and see if we could make anything from them. And we decided to use our blends for 3D printing and print scans of actual corals I had created at the Great Barrier Reef and some open source ones um, because during COVID I couldn't travel, we had lockdowns. These corals are made from different biopolymers with sea urchin shells, pigments, and calcium carbonate, testing and experimenting processing and how they behave in 3D printing. The installation also included two underwater films that I created in collaboration with an underwater photographer and filmmaker, Tom Park. In the films, we show these two locations and the transition from these healthy and vibrant ecosystems to barren wastelands. Through showcasing the material experimentation, the installation also brings forth the opportunity to intervene and to regenerate these environments. The second example of how design can participate in ocean conservation and regeneration is through collaboration with science. In this case, with the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program for the Great Barrier Reef. It is the world's largest project to protect an ecosystem from climate change. It is a project with over 360 researchers working in many sub-projects. And if you would like to know more, please have a look at the gbrrestoration.org. I can only discuss a very small part of the project in this talk. My involvement started with the materials that we had been working with. Our blends were tested alongside with other materials under investigation. But the sea urchin shell's protective properties didn't quite repeat themselves in tropical water but the corals were quite happily growing in one of our biopolymers with just pure calcium carbonate. We don't really know why, but we let the corals choose their materials. And the image you see part of this material testing, in this case with coral fragments, you can see the little dark squares, the corals spreading, but the competing algae not overgrowing them. So the collaboration started here, but in fact the program was interested in including design expertise for other things under development. Design was specifically relevant for the Coral Aquaculture and Deployment sub-program. So our team is focusing on developing a system to raise more heat-tolerant corals in aquaculture and to then deploy these corals with what we call coral seeding devices to the reef in large scale with minimal human intervention. The goal is to deploy millions of corals per year to the Great Barrier Reef, reaching a cost of only a few dollars per coral. It's a huge difference to any other restoration project anywhere. So if you look at these seeding devices more closely, they're small objects and they carry coral sediment tiles on which the corals are grown in aquaculture. We're working on three ways that the corals can be grown on the tiles. One, the coral spawn can settle on them naturally in tanks. Two, we place small fragments of corals on the tiles and three, we place coral larvae inside little tiles or pods. And then we use these little tiles, that we put them in these devices, and these devices are then taken to the parts of the reef that needs help. And together, these three methods are intended to reach the numbers we require annually and a feasible cost per coral. We have just done our first round of experiments with coral larval tiles using our material with promising initial results, and we will continue to investigate this further. And here you see this little yellow dot there. That is a coral that has decided to settle on the device, and that's where it's going to start its life. In the past couple of years, we have designed many, many iterations of the seeding devices, creating features that engage with the reef and prevent them from moving around, protect the corals from in their early stages of life, for example, from predation, that are small, easy to manufacture, and to deploy without human intervention. We have created a modular design, so depending on the reef type, we can deploy different kinds of configurations. We are deploying prototypes to the reef, and we assess how these different designs perform at different types of reef environments. Every few months we go back, we find all of them, measure if they have moved, and if there are any surviving corals. 
We have now deployed around 6,000 prototype devices, dropping them to the reef, simulating an automated deployment. Out of these 6,000, we are able to find over 90% of the devices, and on average, they move around very, very little, about 30 centimeters. And they also start to become fixed to the reef. And this is what we want to see, healthy corals growing on the devices and the devices slowly becoming part of the reef. Survivorship numbers are looking really promising. From the trials until now, after four months, 83%, and after a year, 68% of settlement tiles still have surviving corals. And these are still wild corals. These are not yet the enhanced, more heat-tolerant corals. So through a massive effort, and collaboration of many people and many disciplines, we are working on interventions at scale that can help the Great Barrier Reef resist climate change for a bit longer. Going back to my initial question of what does it mean if corals are our clients? It means non-humans are equal or high importance with humans in the design process. This more than human design is systemic, it is not centered and has to take into account many species and ecosystems. It is design that is collaborative, requiring multiple expertise and different methods of working from the ones typically used by designers. It is design that can help public understand issues and opportunities, and it can also be designed directly contributing to environmental conservation and regeneration. To conclude, with the environmental crises affecting Earth and the ocean, Design must move from human-centered paradigm to more than human design paradigm. We don't have decades to create this shift. We need to create this new practice now and shape environments where humans and non-humans can thrive. Thank you.